Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about 2018 uh, interesting events that happened over the past year and lessons that we can learn from that. Uh, just a quick introduction. My name is Jared Nordia. I'm a cloud architect slash software engineer specializing in security and cryptography. I'm a certified AWS uh, solutions architect and DevOps engineer. And my research interests include privacy and security, uh, working on a number of other certifications. And my uh, Twitter handle is at Jared Nordia. Um, I work for a company called Synthesis. We do specialized software development and cloud consulting for the financial services industry. So we work with banks and other financial services institutions to build out their digital channels, online banking, asset management systems, credit management systems, markets and payments integrations, regulatory and compliance reporting, as well as security solutions. Um, we're also the first advanced AWS consulting partner in Africa and the Middle East, and we are hoping to be premier uh, next year, and we also got our financial services and DevOps competency uh, this year. Uh, my day job is essentially working with banks and enterprises to help them architect, build, secure, and operationalize their cloud environments. So in this talk, we're going to cover a number of topics, first from a global scale, and then towards the end of the presentation, we'll get, uh, it will become more relevant to South Africa. So as we kick off with acquisitions and trends over the past year, we saw um, a lot of security vendors basically improving their threat detection through the use of machine learning, big data, and AI, both on antiviruses as well as EDR products, as well as uh, the SIM tools. Then we saw a number of improvements for getting aggregated views um, across environments to make defend, uh, the life of defenders easier, as well as uh, automated incident response through security orchestration and automation, so that when you actually do get alert, you can actually respond to that. Then there were an, a number of acquisitions, so uh, Splunk acquired Victor Ops for $120 million, BombGo acquired Beyond Trust, as well as MomCast acquired Atata, and then we had a local success story where F-Secure bought MWR. Not all of the acquisitions, however, were actually um, positive. Uh, when Twilio bought Tengrid for $2 billion, analysts really didn't like that, and that sent the tank stocking uh, you know, tank, tanking by 12%. And when Microsoft bought GitHub for $7.5 billion, again, analysts were very concerned about um, the future of GitHub as well as uh, people in the open source community. And when IBM bought Red Hat for $34 billion as a play in the public cloud space, we saw a number of Linux um, uh, distributions issuing statements in support of the acquisition as well as other Linux uh, distros um, issuing statements in the disapproval of the acquisition. So I think in 2018, we can say that it was certainly the year of supply chain problems and supply chain attacks. And we cannot have a retrospective without speaking about probably one of the biggest stories of the year, which is the Bloomberg story about Supermicro, in which Bloomberg alleges, citing 17 sources, that the Chinese government, through the use of bribery and corruption, forced Supermicro, a motherboard and server manufacturer, to insert hardware backdoors into their motherboards during the manufacturing process. One of the key elements of the story was a company called Elemental Technologies, um, which was acquired by Amazon in 2015 and has contracts with the CIA as well as other US intelligence uh, agencies. Now, it makes sense that the Chinese intelligence agencies would want to gain access to their um, systems. So, um, this ch alleged chip is a six-pin SORC, white to gray in color, and at least on a theoretical level, depending on the bus that it was placed on the motherboard, it could basically bypass a lot of um, authentication and could mess with other systems that it was connected to. After the story came out, uh, Supermicro stock tanked by 40%, and both Amazon and Apple issued very strongly worded statements denying that this was actually true. And it's really important to understand that these statements are regulated under the SEC and by Surbans Oxley. So if it turned out that these statements were, inc um, were uh, incorrect or false, they, the boards of those companies could actually be held criminally liable for defrauding their investors. 
which definitely added to a lot of the haze that was uh, around the story. And as time went on, a number of holes started appearing in the story. Firstly, Bloomberg cited 17 anonymous sources as part of their story, including named sources like Joe Fitzpatrick, who is a hardware security researcher. And when Bloomberg uh, approached him to... Um, to comment on the story, they asked him, you know, how would such an attack uh, work? And he came up with a number of possibilities. And it is very interesting that every single possibility that he came up with was actually confirmed by the sources, which is a major red flag. In addition to that, the sources behind the story, or the journalists rather, um, they have a very bad track record of kind of bending the truth. And they have in the past created fictitious articles that have been widely uh, denied in the security community. And then there's also the question about the practicality of this attack. Because if you wanted to uh, be able to break into systems on demand, it would probably be more practical to backdoor the firmware rather than trying to have a hardware backdoor implant. What was interesting after the story um, came out, there was this narrative in the US that we can't trust uh, China and uh, basically everybody should buy a US uh, gear, which is very interesting because at roughly around the same time period, there was a ban on Huawei and ZTE equipment inside of um, America, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. Um, and so three years ago, I published a paper um, looking at the Edward Snowden documents and I basically made an argument in that paper that we in the security community can't look at um, intelligence agencies as uh, you know, friends. We should view them as adversaries. And what we also saw in the Edward Snowden document is that the NSA has their own catalog for hardware backdoor implants. We also know that the NSA routinely intercepts uh, hardware. So in this case, they intercept uh, Cisco devices where they put their own hardware backdoors into those devices during the shipping process. So it is completely possible that Chinese intelligence is doing the same thing. However, in conclusion, we can say that the story as reported by Bloomberg is a load of rubbish. There's a lot of facts that have been uh, disputed uh, by many sources, including the Department of Homeland Security and uh, UK intelligence. Um, however, I do think that there is more to the story than what is cu currently public. Then staying in uh, uh, supply chain attacks, uh, Ticketmaster was breached earlier this year. A number of customers in Europe had fraud on their card. And um, Monzo, who is a startup bank in the UK, uh, they had customers that also had fraud on their card. And during the investigation process, um, they ran a bunch of statistical analysis on these transactions. And they found that um, uh, Ticketmaster was most likely the cause of the, uh, the breach card information. And um, they then contacted uh, Ticketmaster telling them that you know, they probably had been breached. And Ticketmaster's response was basically, well, there hasn't been a breach, as opposed to, we haven't found it yet. And then Monza found the smoking gun, which was, uh, they had one customer that only had one um, e-commerce transaction. And when it was used on Ticketmaster, the, t the transaction was declined because the expiry date was incorrect. And then the fraudsters tried to make a transaction which was also declined with the incorrect expiry date. And that effectively was, there's no other plausible explanation other than Ticketmaster was the source of the uh, information. And the Ticketmaster breach was caused by a third party that they use, which was breached. So this third party provides third party um, uh, chat support. Um, and they were breached, and then this uh, the attackers added JavaScript to harvest these uh, cards. And the group that was behind this is MageCard. They hit a number of other um, companies, including British Airways, New Egg, and Feedify, including thousands of other smaller e-commerce um, uh, sites. We also saw the Browser Loud breach, which is a third-party service for accessibility, so people with hearing and visual impairments um, can use their software to basically read um, websites. And it is used by over 4,200 websites, including a lot of governments, including the US, 
the UK, Australia and New Zealand, including many others. The question then arises, how do we defend against these attacks? And there are basically three ways that we can do that. We can use sub-resource integrity, where we create a SHA hash of the JavaScript, and we add that as an attribute in our script tags, so that when the browser loads the JavaScript, it will compare its hash to the hash that you have specified. If you do this, it's very important that you version your JavaScript because if you have some kind of automated process to create your JavaScript, um, this might actually break things. The other thing that you can do is you can use content security policies where you restrict which domains you load JavaScript from. What you can also do is um, you can uh, restrict which content types uh, are loaded. In addition to that, you can then actually send these violations to your own reporting infrastructure. Or just to make things easier, you can use the service called Report URI that um, is actually very economical and it makes it easy to actually roll these things out. Then with the rise in, pub, um, in the popularity of games like Fortnite and PUBG, over the past year there has been an explosion in online game cheating. So online game cheating is not really new. Um, about 10 years ago, uh, there were a number of Black Hat, uh, oh, sorry, DEF CON talks, um, you know, addressing how you can actually cheat in online games by, by, by manipulating the uh, execution stack, memory pointers, and registry. You can do things like create bullets that appear from nowhere. You can have unlimited health, ammo, and um, um, resources. Uh, you can uh, jump around in the map, you can see through walls, you can shoot through walls, um, and you can do th uh, those types of things. Now, because a lot of the processing is happening on the client side, it's actually very difficult to defend against this because um, a lot of online games, they, the servers just basically act as traffic control for what's going on. So what, uh, what a lot of uh, c game companies have done is they've created very intrusive anti-cheating capabilities on uh, their clients, which have their own set of privacy problems. And um, people in China specifically are actually monetizing online game cheating by um, they will join you in a match. So if you are playing PUBG or Fortnite, they will make sure that your team wins. And when you have games like uh, Tom Clancy's The Division, where you have a leveling up system, they will join you in game and then help you level up faster. Then in May, uh, we had the enforcement of GDPR and uh, basically a massive amount of hysteria around it. Uh, kind of everybody lo lost their minds, including a lot of publishers. A number of websites closed down. And after we were bombarded, uh, sorry, after we were bombarded uh, with email about companies updating their privacy policies, a number of people outside the EU were basically, sorry, were basically searching how we can block EU users from our websites. So there were a number of ways. One was using Cloudflare workers. The other one is basically using um, uh, SaaS as uh, SaaS services, which is basically JavaScript that you run on your website and it will block um, European citizens from visiting your uh, site. Um, what was also interesting is that a lot of websites, including the uh, USA Today, um, when they removed all of their tracking scripts to be compliant with GDPR, it actually reduced the no amount of bandwidth that you needed to load the website. So that actually resulted in a better experience for everybody. But a lot of this hysteria was misplaced because if you actually go read the GDPR legislation, it's not meant to be applied in a draconian way. It's actually somewhat forgiving and it's only on your third strike is the maximum penalty actually due. Um, so a lot of the sites that closed down, while some of them were not compatible with GDPR completely due to how they handled data, a lot of them closed down without any you know, real reason, or valid reason, I should say. Um, so as we move on to vulnerabilities, uh, you know, t 2018 had a lot of interesting vulnerabilities. I've just selected two that were personally interesting to me. 
Um, the first one was a vulnerability that Oracle published in October of last year, which was a vulnerability in WebLogic. In December of 2017, a Chinese security researcher published an exploit uh, to um, exploit this vulnerability. And then once it was released, it was basically turned into a mechanism to install crypto miners on uh, vulnerable systems. And one of the most vulnerable uh, or most impacted systems was um, uh, systems running PeopleSoft, which is a HR uh, middleware application. And uh, the attackers, by um, taking advantage of vulnerable PeopleSoft uh, systems, managed to mine over $250,000 in Monero. Um, and basically how the vulnerability worked is attackers would uh, exploit a system, kill any other miners that were running on the system, and then create a cron job to constantly download the miner and run it. Then the other interesting malware was the VPN fil filter malware, which took advantage of um, a firmware vulnerability running in ASUS, D-Link, Huawei, Ubiquiti, and a number of others. Um, millions of devices were actually affected by this, and uh, the malware was a multi-stage uh, payload. So the first stage um, uh, created persistence, which is actually unique because a lot of malware that affects IoT devices, um, when the device is rebooted, um, the malware is not persistent. The second stage then went to go download the actual um, payload that would intercept your HTTPS connections to get credentials. Once it had those credentials, it would then send that to a command and control server. And then the third stage basically added additional functionality, including uh, the communication over Tor, um, as well as a number of other features. And when this happened, I went to go set up my own set of honeypots um, to look at what was going on. I saw a lot of traffic from Russia, um, the Ukraine, Brazil, and Egypt, as well as some other countries. And what was most interesting is that in on my honeypots that I was running, I found three unique groups of attackers. And on a random basis, but between three and 10 minutes, another attacker would exploit the vulnerability wipe the malware of the previous attacker and then install their own version. And this went on the whole day and basically the whole week that I was running these honeypots. Then as we move on to HTTPS and encryption, so earlier this year we had a new version of PCI DSS which mandated the use of TLS 1.1 by the 30th of June, uh, as well as additional requirements for multi-factor authentication. We also saw a massive rise in uh, HTTPS adoption where over 70% uh, of the internet today is actually encrypted versus 30 to 40% uh, three or four years ago. We also had new tools um, to visualize the CA e uh, ecosystem. So Cloudflare developed a tool called Merkle Town, which is based on the certificate transparency logs and it can actually show us what's actually going on um, uh, in the CA industry. We know that uh, about 700,000 certificates are being issued per day. The majority of that comes from uh, Let Encrypt and um, uh, elliptic curve uh, cryptography certificates are still in the minority. I think primarily because um, a lot of services, especially cloud services, do not support elliptic curve yet. We also saw the death of public key pinning. So if you're not familiar with public key pinning, it is basically a mechanism for you to pin your public key so that when you have a returning visitor, they should expect to see the same public key. The problem with this is, is that um, on systems where it is deployed or even systems where it is not deployed, if an attacker gets into your system, they can turn on this feature or actually delete your certificates and create a new one, basically creating a massive denial of service uh, attack. And a number of companies were actually affected by this. And both Mozilla and Google kind of had to you know, bail them out uh, through an emergency patch. Um, and so this is actually going to be deprecated or has been deprecated in uh, a lot of the major browsers. Um, we also saw distrust for Symantec uh, coming into force this year. So due to uh, Symantec's bad behavior over the past year, uh, few years, uh, Google decided uh, to uh, distrust them. 
Uh, Symantec then sold their CA business to Digicert for a billion dollars, and that then led into the next incident, uh, which was the Trustico incident. Um, so Trustico is a reseller of um, uh, certificates or semantic certificates, which was now owned by Digicert, and they wanted to move all of their customers away from Symantec over to Komodo, and in a pure money grab, the CEO then emailed Digicert to revoke all of these certificates, and Digicert refused because customers should uh, revoke their own certificates. And then the CEO emailed 23,000 private keys to Digicert, and under the CA forum rules, Digicert had to revoke them, which they did in four hours. Like, good job, guys. Um, and this, and a, a lot of people actually had. Uh, outages due to this because uh, you can imagine, you know, if your certificate has been revoked and you don't know about it and your customers try and connect and they are verifying whether your certificate has been revoked or not, that won't work. Um, it was also then came out that uh, Trustico was generating all of uh, their customer certificates and storing the private keys on their own infrastructure with no protection, no encryption, no uh, encrypted data uh, stores, uh, no use of hardware security modules, nothing like that. They were also vulnerable to both SQL and command injection on their website. Um, so you could actually just go through their website and get all of those private keys. And we in the security community cannot allow such reckless and irresponsible behavior. We in the community need to hold these types of resellers and uh, CAs accountable for their actions. And this speaks to larger issues in the... Um, CA community, so um, Komodo uh, CA was acquired by Francesco Partners, which is a private equity firm which also owns the NSO Malware Group. So the NSO Malware Group basically creates uh, malware for governments, and I think it's very problematic that a private equity company owns both a company that does, uh, who is a certificates authority, as well as a company that d creates malware. Then, with the uh, increasing um, development of quantum uh, computers, uh, NIST created a call for papers, basically asking people to um, submit uh, f uh, papers for new quantum-resistant algorithms. And uh, in this, uh, in 2018, we entered the analysis phase. So these algorithms have been created, and now they are being assessed to see if they have any weaknesses. What is very interesting, though, is that there's this trend that has emerged to mix strong AES encryption with quantum-resistant algorithms. And one of the companies that is doing that is a company called Senitas, which is an Australian company that makes layer two line encryptors. And I think the trend of mixing AES with quantum-resistant uh, cryptography algorithms is actually uh, uh, it's quite cool. Um, then uh, TLS 1.3 was approved by the Internet Engineering Task Force, um, and it replaces TLS 1.2, and a number of uh, features were removed from TLS 1.3, basically all of the bad stuff, um, RC4, SH1, MD5, renegotiation, and then a number of features were added to TLS 1.3, including downgrade protection and perfect forward secrecy. Um, we also uh, get a massive speed improvement, so TLS 1.2 has two round trips in the key negotiation process, whereas um, with TLS 1.3 we only have one round trip, which uh, speeds uh, key negotiation up quite dramatically. TLS also has um, a new feature called zero uh, trip resumption, which allows a client that is already connected to your website to connect again without having to negotiate keys. Now, there is a problem with this, and that is that if an attacker manages to um, capture the session information, they can basically create a replay attack against the uh, infrastructure. So this uh, feature isn't enabled by default, for obvious reasons, but if you do use it for GET requests, it should be uh, quite sufficient. Um, so one of the big uh, controversies of TLS 1.3 is the middle box problem. So that's WAFs, load balances, and proxies. So a client connects to uh, a website, they go through a proxy uh, or any other middle box, and then um, that would respond, um, um, you know, I support TLS 
two, and then in an additional security header, it will say, hey, do you support TLS 1.3? And then um, if the client supports TLS 1.3, it will open a new TLS 1.3 connection, and because most proxies don't support it, it will actually break. Now, because proxies um, cannot intercept TLS 1.3 because it has perfect forward secrecy, this becomes a very big problem for enterprises that rely on TLS interception devices. So the only way you can make this work with uh, a proxy is basically you have to terminate the connection on the proxy and then create a new connection from the proxy to whatever site that you are going to uh, go to. But that has drastic performance problems for the proxies that enterprises currently have. The argument was also made that um, we should move away from a world where our um, protections are on the network perimeter, and we should move those uh, controls onto the endpoint, kind of building out a zero trust uh, environment. And I also predict in the next 18 months, we're actually gonna see a massive security incident related to TLS 1.3, because it is so different from the other versions. We also know from research that uh, proxies are actually not good for security. In many cases, due to misconfigurations, they actually weaken security because they um, will accept self-signed certificates, um, uh, certificates that are um, expired, as well as um, they, can, uh, they are often vulnerable to downgrade attacks so that the connection between the client and the proxy is actually more secure than the connection between the proxy and the actual site that you're trying to go to. Then moving along to BGB hijacking. So um, BGB hijacking is not uh, something that is uh, new. Um, you know, we saw the first incident in 1997, but over the past year, we've seen uh, over 17,000 incidents re relating to problems with BGP. The two major ones was when a Russian ISP hijacked the IP space of Visa and MasterCard as well as when somebody in America hijacked, or an attacker in America hijacked Amazon's DNS to steal cryptocurrency. Now, the week after I presented this at Hexcon in uh, Joburg, um, a Nigerian ISP, through a bit of fat fingering, um, basically caused um, Google's traffic to flow through Russia and China, and the fact that this is even possible is uh, actually a major concern for us on the internet. The fact that because the internet is built on trust, that any announcements are kind of trusted. Um, so what essentially happened, while this wasn't malicious, um, a main one in Nigeria um, announced uh, incorrect uh, routes, which then forced that traffic to go through China and Russia. Um, and to kind of combat this a little bit, uh, Cloudflare has created um, RPKI, which basically takes the PKI that we use for uh, certificates authorities and kind of merges it onto um, BGP announcements. Now, this is a band-aid solution because um, this is you know kind of trying to put a patch on a very big problem, but it also requires that a lot of people actually adopt it in order for it to be... Um, uh, successful. Now, how this would work is when um, a network uh, creates a BGP announcement that is then signed, and then the regional uh, internet registries like APNIC, AFNIC, uh, and RIPE, um, they will actually va validate that the announcement is actually um, correct. Now, as we move to, uh, as we focus on South Africa, if we look at our own space with a lot of cloud providers coming to South Africa and a lot of SaaS providers coming to South Africa who, uh, and a lot of them are creating points of presence inside of Terraco, when we actually look at the BGB routes for South Africa, we actually see a number of providers there that um, um, you know, are quite centered and are quite critical. And if you actually go look at a lot, a lot of the major banks, they all use common providers. And in Terraco, they also host a number of um, smaller ISPs, which typically don't have the best security. So it is completely possible that an attacker could attack a small ISP, create a fraudulent BGB announcement, and then basically intercept traffic going to banks or any other of their targets. 
the question then becomes how do we defend against this and unfortunately other than the RPKI thing that I just mentioned which is kind of a band-aid solution um, there isn't really a proper way to defend against this. What we can do however is we can um, deploy DNSSEC uh, which will validate the DNS path that uh, your browser uh, goes through. Um, one of the other things that we can do is we can add certificates, of, um, certificates authority authorization records, which is a DNS entry that you make to say which uh, CAs are allowed to issue certificates for your domain. So if, uh, if you are a victim of a BGB hijacking, um, someone can't go issue certificates because they own your public uh, space and basically perform a man-in-the-middle attack. Um, so if, if your IP space is actually hijacked, it is possible for an attacker to basically remove these DNS records, but you're just making it a lot harder for them. So as we move to containers, cloud, and uh, DevOps, or DevFlops, um, so a number of uh, banks and enterprises in South Africa have adopted a multi-cloud strategy, including both private and public cloud, in addition to uh, uh, quite a vast array of SaaS uh, services. The question then comes in, how do we as defenders actually defend against all of these things? And it's actually really, really difficult. And I think we are seeing a lot of the banks and enterprises really struggle with this. Because in the conventional world, we would put a whole bunch of agents on our builds. But when we start looking at containers, it starts to become quite complicated. Because do you put the agents on the host or in the container or on both of them? And shouldn't containers be lightweight? So ideally, you shouldn't be putting those agents in the containers. However, you do have um, you know, people that kind of treat containers as virtual machines, and you need to basically protect the rest of your organization. And when we have things like Kubernetes, which is becoming increasingly popular, this picture even gets even more um, muddled. Because if you have Kubernetes, do you have one stack for your entire environment, or do you section it off per business unit or per function? Um, and we expect the popularity of Kubernetes to grow uh, quite dramatically. We've, uh, in 2016, we had two clients that were using Kubernetes. This year, we have seven clients that are using Kubernetes, and we expect that to double next year. So if we look at uh, DevOps and Agile, um, we know from research that teams that use Waterfall take three to four months to respond to a security uh, vulnerability uh, versus agile teams that take two to three weeks. However, enterprises and organizations that are actually using DevOps today are actually less secure than the, um, the organizations that are not using it. And the question comes in, how, why is this the case? And fundamentally, it comes down to foundational problems. Um, organizations are not putting in the foundations of their DevOps tooling correctly, and they are baking in security as an afterthought. A lot of them are practicing Agile, which is basically Agile that's basically waterfall. So they have stand-up meetings with a Kanban board, and now they're doing Agile, but they really are not doing Agile. Um, and then a lot of them... Um, a lot of operation teams in organizations, they're basically the firefighters for the organization. So they constantly have fires burning in their organization that they deal with instead of actually spending time and actually putting in fire prevention, uh, you know, as a metaphor. Um, one of the other problems is a problem uh, regarding enterprise architecture. So there is often a big debate in organizations as to who should own the DevOps tooling inside an organization. So in closing, a lot of organizations, they want to use cloud, they want to use DevOps and all of the good things that it can bring, but a lot of them don't think of the foundations that they need to put in place as well as the journey that they need to take their organizations through. And on that note, that is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions? Awesome presentation. There was a lot to take in. Uh, is, will the slides be available? You might have, I don't know if you mentioned that. I'll, I'll tweet them out later tonight. I'll, I'll tweet them out later tonight, yeah. Yes. Uh, 
Um, so that is certainly possible. It, in my experience, I haven't found that to be the problem. In my experience, I've found um, that often um, when they put those tools in, they can't uh, often operationalize those tools. That is actually the kind of bigger problem that I've found personally. No one else? Any quiet? Cool. Oh, yes. Um, so in the past, we used to be very, um, uh, you know, we used to be very open to ideas. Uh, right now, because we are basically working with all of the major banks, we've taken a very different approach where we are actually very prescriptive because we found that out that a lot of organizations actually don't know what they want. So we basically tell them what they should have and then they can disagree with us and then we'll deal with it. Um, but I think a set of best practices as well as real world experience of implementing that is the correct way to go. And you really do need the correct consulting partners as well as architects in your own business in order to make it successful. That's what we have found with working with our various clients. Um, so I think it's a very good idea. Um, cloud technology, which is where I mostly spend most of my time, it makes it very easy to do that. Um, I've seen a number of banks in South Africa. There's three banks that are trying to do zero trust at the moment. One of the problems that they are finding is that because of all of their legacy environments, it's actually difficult to know what talks to everything. And in order to do zero trust properly, you actually need a number of capabilities which they don't have. And Fundamentally, a lot of the problems actually comes down to um, you have political or politics in organizations that basically block the rollout of this because uh, of the fear that it might break stuff. And what we've also found, uh, and uh, again, the operationalization of, of, of zero trust. Because you know, if you isolate everything through network access control, um, you you know, you might break stuff and then you need a team that actually deals with those incidents and basically restores uh, functionality. So what's very complicated is, um, especially at banks, on their core banking systems, they, uh, systems may only talk to other systems once every three months or once every six months. So even if you have monitoring, um, you might not be 100% certain that you know your data and traffic flows. Um, so it's quite a, it's a difficult problem. Yes. I can't can't comment. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, we uh, we no names. <laughs> yeah, I've seen those photos too. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> um, yeah, it's difficult. Uh, let me answer your question this way, and I understand I'm not actually answering your question. So, um, uh, one of the problems with cloud is that uh, core banking uh, applications are not going to be moving to cloud anytime soon, right? There's always going to need be a need for low latency hardware on premise. In addition to the fact that right now uh, banks can't put their payments HSMs inside of uh, cloud at the moment, so payments HSMs will always be something at least for the foreseeable future will be on premise. So in terms of security, I have seen um, a lot of uh, thinking that is correct, but unfortunately we've also seen um, organizations basically falling for the same problems. So one of the new banks, uh, we've seen that they are falling into the same um, politics, uh, bad communication, um, uh, you know, uh, aspects that larger enterprises have. Um, 
Ja, ah, nein, sorry. <lacht> Ja. So, 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 so my feeling about outposts is that I actually think it sends the wrong messages to enterprises. Um, I can tell you that there are five banks, no, sorry, three banks in South Africa that are using Azure Stack, and all of them hate it because um, the the architecture when you run stuff on premise is very different to how you would do it on um, actually on Azure. Uh, one of the big problems is is when you do when you have automation that joins instances to a domain, and uh, depending how you architect Azure Stack, that actually becomes very 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 difficult. Um, so I guess they would probably do that, but I'm not a fan of of that. I under also understand that there may be enterprises that need stuff on premise and maybe that is the whole with the view that they should move to like proper public cloud in the future. Yes. Um, I actually don't think they give it any thought. One thing I have seen, though, is that um, a number of banks are actually building out um, security tools for their CI/CD pipelines. And one of the things that those tools do is they will actually scan what libraries you are using um, to actually tell you whether it's, it has vulnerabilities and whether the library itself is actually trustworthy or not. Um, that 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 isn't um, quantitative. It's very like uh, uh, not. Uh, yeah, it's like very, very opinionated. Um, there are some vendors that they like, but there isn't like formal, I haven't seen formal, like, thou shalt buy this, yeah. Okay, <laughs> uh, last question. Um, so they don't. So the um, uh, so a lot of the licensing problems actually get solved in cloud if you use on demand. Because Microsoft and Oracle and some of the other vendors they've actually blocked you from taking your on-premise licenses uh, to cloud. Uh, Microsoft with SQL Server is the most notab noticeable one of that. Um, I guess. What the other people are doing is they're actually using um, SaaS software like Flexera and putting agents on all of the infrastructure to basically report all of that. <laughs>